But tonight, just the first stanza, and then uh, Brother Bob will lead us in prayer. Breathe on me, breath of God. Mm, breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew. That I may love what Thou dost love, and do what Thou wouldst do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, first of all, thank you for another week here that we all made it through safe, healthy, and, and here to get another blessing tonight with you present. Please be with the ones that aren't here tonight for whatever reason, and also be with the ones that really need to hear the word to give a revelation to revive them and get you closer in their hearts. Be with the pastor today as he gives us more insight and what we need to do to get closer to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Bob, and thank you again for being here tonight. We will be uh, looking at the topic where the rubber meets the road. And then we have two more nights. Next Wednesday night will be this little light of mine. And... Uh, about witnessing and how to be a light for Jesus. And we'll finish with a forever walk with Jesus because that's where it ends, is eternity with Jesus. We started out with Jesus loves me and we've gone step by step until by the end it's not just steps to Jesus, it's steps with Jesus. So tonight we're going to read again our memory text from uh, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. Let's read this together out loud. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Amen. Amen. I hope that this verse is burned into our minds and into our hearts. Uh, because days will come. Maybe you are having days like this already, but days are coming when we're going to need texts like this to lean on. We may not even have our Bibles, but the texts that we've stored up in our minds, the Holy Spirit will bring to our hearts. Don't you just love that picture? The dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit, hovering over the earth, and there's the element of fire there. This is what can happen. It's maybe a paradox. It is a paradox that in the quietness of this time together, and I appreciate, you know, when we're finished with prayer that we, we keep it quiet. I mean, you know, if we talk, we talk very quietly as others are finishing praying. And in the quietness of this moment, Holy Spirit, fire powers coming from heaven <laughs> and filling our hearts and your lives. My life, your life. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I thank you for participating in our prayer time each night. Prayer, as I pointed out on our very first night, is an integral part of every revival. Singing, praying, preaching, testifying. They're all components of great revivals of the past. But I have to mention, I'll, I'll mention another one, uh, but I, I just have to mention that some revivals have taken place solely by people praying in their homes and praying in small groups in their homes. It never even actually, you know, they didn't have services at the church like we're doing now. It all was born on prayer. And tonight, in just a few moments, I'll share with you uh, another way that a revival happened. <clears throat> Tonight, our window into revivals of the past. 
we come now to the second Great Awakening. The first Great Awakening was during the 1700s. The first Great Awakening. The second Great Awakening began around in the 1790s and up into the 1840s and beyond. I mean, depending on what historian you read and where they divide it all up. Uh, but that's generally the, the area. This time frame here, the 1840s, should ring a bell for some of the Adventists because um, of the history of the denomination. And I might mention that this particular photograph, now we haven't really shown photographs up to this time, we've been showing sketches and paintings, right? Uh, but now we're into the uh, 1800s. This is actually a Millerite camp meeting. Photograph of a Millerite camp meeting that uh, took place in uh, the northeastern United States. The early Adventist church, not yet the Seventh, the seventh Adventist church wasn't organized until 1863. But Adventists were people who were, you know, like Methodists were called Methodists before there was a Methodist church. Uh, Adventists were people who believed in the literal second coming of Christ. And the, the Millerites were followers of William Miller, followers in, as far as, you know, what he was preaching. So the early Adventist church emerged from a climate of religious revival that was sweeping New England at the time. And William Miller had no small part in that. And camp meetings such as this were a hallmark of the second Great Awakening. First Great Awakening, recall, was the era of uh, the Wesley brothers and George Whitfield and many, many others. In this, uh, th you may not be able to tell very well from the picture, but this is a, the top of a tent. They're sitting inside of a tent. And here you see lamp posts. There's one right here. And uh, some of these tents would seat thousands of people with more, you know, a lot of people outside that couldn't even fit inside. And you can tell that the picture's being taken from the front, obviously, because people are looking towards the camera, but you can also see the pulpit here and the, perhaps a Bible laying there on the front. So people were hungry for the Word of God. They were hungry for something new in their life. One of the prominent figures in the Second uh, Great Awakening was a preacher by the name of Charles Finney. He was an American Presbyterian minister and a leader in the Second Great Awakening in the United States. The Second Great Awakening also was happening in Europe as well, particularly in England. But he's called, he's referred to as the, the father of modern revivalism. He was best known as an innovative revivalist from, for a 10-year period, 1825 to 1835, in upstate New York and in the Manhattan area. It's interesting that his religious views and his understanding of Scripture led him to take some positions for social reforms, such as the abolition of slavery and equal education for women and for blacks. 1825 to 1835 is when he had his preaching ministry, long before the Civil War. That was in the 1860s. And so there were these preachers who not only had the gospel to share, but the impact of the gospel was that you know, in Christ, there's no male, female, bond or free, right? And uh, early Seventh-day Adventists were involved with the temperance movement. Ellen White, one of the founders of this, of this denomination, was uh, a sought-after speaker uh, by the uh, temperance movement. And so uh, we come now to William Miller. He lived from 1782 to 1849. So you notice his, his death date there. Whoops, hit the wrong button, sorry. His death date of 1849, or death year at least, um, 1843 was when he thought Christ would come, and then 1844, but he thought the cleansing of the sanctuary meant the cleansing of the earth with, with Christ's second coming. And uh, so that's referred to as the great disappointment, and a lot of people that were following the preaching of William Miller went back to their churches and went on, uh, life went on, but many went back to the scriptures and kept studying and realized that what happened in 1844 was an event that happened in heaven. But that's another topic for another series. 
for another night. Sufficient, suffice it to say that with his death date of 1849, he was toward the end of his ministry, really. When, uh, and he wasn't, a, he wasn't a trained preacher. He was just a, a, an astute student of the Bible. But estimates of the number of people who were following his preaching and accepted his ideas vary from 50,000 to 500,000. It's hard to nail it down, but there was, you know, a substantial following. And his legacy includes the Advent Christian Church, which today numbers around 60,000, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church with over 18 million members worldwide. Both these denominations have their legacy, their roots go back to the preaching of William Miller during the Second Great Awakening. Let me tell you now about some lumbermen from Pennsylvania. It was the spring of 1828-1829 and uh, in the spring the lumbermen would bring all of the, the logs that they had harvested, bring them to the river bank and you know they'd lash them together and you've maybe seen pictures or movies of, of these huge flotillas of, of logs going down the river and they would take them down to Pennsylvania, uh, to, uh, to uh, Philadelphia, uh, to, the, to the sawmills. Well, they had delivered their lumber to the sawmills and they came to the, hear the preaching of Charles Finney, the one I had his picture on here a while ago. 1825 to 1835 was when he, he was in his heyday, you might say, of preaching. And this was 1828, 1829. Well, many of these lumbermen who went to hear Finney preach were converted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changed their lives. And uh, maybe aside from coal miners, lumbermen were some of the roughest people around. Well, as they returned back upriver, they were already praying for their co-workers who they had left back in the lumber uh, camps upriver. And through the influence of Charles Finney's preaching on these lumbermen and these lumbermen praying for their, for their friends and co-workers, conversions began to take place. They would pray in their cabins, their shacks, experience conversion, and then those new converts would go out and share their faith as well. This went on over a period of two or three years and the net result was that over, by 1831, over 5,000 of these lumbermen had been converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ and their lives changed. Without a single pastor or a single church anywhere in the area, I mean, these, they were out in the sticks, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Without a single minister of the gospel, it was a harvest because of the testimony, the power of their testimony. Never underestimate the power of your testimony. It happened for these lumbermen. Well, tonight we're going to look at the topic where the rubber meets the road. Last time we talked about how important it is to choose Christ and to walk with him every day, to choose him every day. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about more, what more we can expect in that daily walk and what challenges we might face as we walk the daily walk with Christ. So as we begin our focus on scripture now, I invite you to bow your heads with me once again as we pray. Dear Lord, tonight we're getting down to some nitty, nitty gritty where the rubber meets the road. Daily Christian living. It's, it sounds good on paper, as they say, but when the rubber meets the road, that's when we, we find ourselves in situations where we're calling on you for help. And you're there. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, you will hear from heaven. And so, Father, tonight I pray that you would hear us from heaven and you would grant us a further gift tonight of your spirit 
as we look at some text together, as we are challenged by the Spirit of God to live lives that are exemplary for Christ, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, where the rubber meets the road. I take, I take my uh, title. It is an expression, but it's an expression that Firestone used for a jingle back in the 1960s. Some of us may remember it. Wherever wheels are turning, no matter what the load. I got to start out too high. The name that's known as Firestone, where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> when we walk the walk, when we're walking daily with Christ, we are a disciple, right? A disciple. A disciple is someone who follows someone. We're called Christians because we follow Christ. And being a disciple means bearing Christ's name. And of course, we want to represent him in the best possible light, right? If we are Christians and we bear Christ's name, we want, to re we want our lives to reflect positively on Jesus, right? Does that make sense? For the Christian disciple, where the rubber meets the road is this. Can people tell there is a difference about us as Christians? Can they tell? Or are we just like everybody else? Is it evident in our, in our lives, in our words, in our actions, in our countenance that the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit is in our lives? I believe that if the power of the Holy Spirit is in our lives, it is going to make a positive difference. And people will see a difference. Now, Jesus was speaking of false prophets when he said these words. Let's read this together. Matthew 7, 16. You will know them by their fruits. Okay, so he's talking about false prophets, but the, the, the converse is true. Because likewise, when I'm a Christian, it should be evident by the fruits of the Spirit in my life. The fruits of the Spirit. I was age 15 when I was baptized as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Raised in the Methodist Church, grew up believing in God. Went off on a tangent into the occult. God steered me back. Praise the Lord. But at age 15, and I was baptized. I've been sprinkled as a baby. I didn't remember that. <laughs> but I'm glad that, you know, my parents wanted me to being dedicated, but uh, I believed that this verse was for me. Let's read this together, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. Do you believe that? Amen. A new life. Not because of what I work myself up to but because of what God does for me when I'm on my knees. And every day as I choose him and say, Lord, I want to represent you in the best possible way. Please help me. Now, <laughs> some of us don't need a lot of help in certain areas. Let's say uh, patience. Some of us are just naturally patient people. <laughs> and uh, so we don't need a lot of help with that. Kindness. Some of us don't need much help with being kind and thoughtful. Uh, others of us, we don't need any help with being positive. We're just kind of naturally bubbly and friendly and outgoing. Now, I mentioned to, the, uh, to you the other night that because I started singing with my brothers in a quartet before I was even in kindergarten, I didn't know anything about stage fright. So I had no problem getting up front. But I am by nature a shy person. And so God has had to help me work with that and learn social skills and be, be, be more outgoing. But as most shy people or introverted people that you talk with, uh, that 
can operate as um, extroverted persons, they need their downtime. They need time when they can kind of decompress. But God helps us with that. Some of us do need a little help with our rough edges. And you know what? God is ready to help us with that. And so often, unfortunately, we tend to notice the rough edges on our fellow Christians. <laughs> and there's a verse about that, right? About the beam and the, and the speck and all of that. We don't need to go into that. So pray for yourself. Pray that God would help you be the best possible representative of him to others, including your brothers and sisters in the church. Well, um, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. But that doesn't mean that, you know, when we come up out of the water, we have arrived. No. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Exactly. So, you know, I was age 15 when I was baptized. I just turned 59. You do the math. Um, beyond me at the moment. But uh, I've been, a, you know, a Seventh Amish Christian for many years. God still has things to teach me. He still has rough edges to knock off. Just ask my family. <laughs> Sometimes a Christian may say, I can't tell you the exact time or the exact place when I gave my heart to Christ. But of course that doesn't mean that they're not a child of God, that they haven't had a conversion experience. On the contrary, it just illustrates what Jesus told Nicodemus. Let's read this from John 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, begins to work on a person's life, I think, from even before they're born. <laughs> um, but throughout our lives, he, he works in our lives and in our hearts. So you may not have a, a conversion moment that you can put point to, but God has led you through your life, and that's just as miraculous. Because the work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind like the wind. It blows where it wishes. And like the wind, we, we don't see it, but we can feel the effects of it. Um, Aaron, when I went out to play ball with the dogs this morning, I turned and faced away from the wind. <laughs> I didn't want the wind in my face. Um, so we can, we can certainly see the effects of the wind in the same way. We can't see the Spirit of God as He's working on our hearts, but His power does bring us new life. We're a new creature, as the King James has it. So by the power of the Spirit of God working in your heart, you can see, and others can see, what He has done. The bottom line, our lives will show a change when our hearts have been changed by the Spirit of God. And it's to His credit. It's not to our credit, to my credit. And this isn't salvation by works because we can't do this of ourselves. It's because we can't change our own hearts and our characters that we have to come to Christ and to the Holy Spirit for that power and for that change. So we can't believe that our good deeds will save us. But our lives will show whether or not we have the grace of Christ in our hearts. Because it will change our character, our habits, our attitudes, our words, the way we live. And other people will see the difference too between the way we used to be and the way we are now. And you know, Christian character isn't shown by, by just one good deed or one bad deed. Our characters are shown by 
the habitual way that we live our life, day in and day out, because none of us are perfect. Maybe you are one of those people that have the gift of patience. <laughs> and 99 times out of, t out of 10, <laughs> That's not a good fraction, is it? 99 times out of 100, you're patient. Once in a while, you may lose your patience. Well, we have that text. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. So it's not the occasional good deed or bad deed that, that uh, God is looking at, and others look at it, too. We are human. We can flub up. We can make mistakes. But let's, let's not get bogged down with that. Or if we see someone else make a mistake, let's not get bogged down with that. Let's get back on track or pray for them and help them get back on track. Because our characters are shown by the overall pattern of our lives. And when we become a new person in Jesus Christ, the gifts of the Spirit are unleashed in our lives. And what are those gifts? Let's read that list that's in Galatians Chapter 5 and verse 22. Let's read this together out loud. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's quite a list. And I sure can't do all that on my own, can you? But by the grace of God, those are the gifts He wants to give us. You see, Jesus said that he is the vine and we are the branches. And if we remain in him, we will bear fruit. So, after you're converted and you've surrendered your heart to Christ and you're living for him and you wish to honor him with all of your being, with all of your life, you wish to honor him in your life in any way possible, when you're faced with a temptation, when you're faced with a temptation that if you gave into it, it would seem to benefit you in some way, at least in the short term, short run, but you turn away from that temptation even if no human eye sees it. That's where the rubber really meets the road. Because his law is written in your heart. His law is written in your heart. To paraphrase the words of faithful Joseph in Potiphar's house, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So when that temptation comes, that would benefit you in some way, at least in the short run, if you would succumb to it, and no one would be the wiser. You recoil from it because you know it would dishonor God. When no other person on earth would even know about it. Do you want to know if you're truly converted? <laughs> Here's a good evidence. And again, it's not any doing of ours. It's God writing his law in our hearts and us surrendering to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But that is the evidence that the love of God is in your heart. When you do the right thing, even when no one is watching, that's where the rubber meets the road. That is the test of discipleship. That means that you've claimed this promise in Hebrews 10, verse 16, which is a quotation from the Old Testament. Let's read this together. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Isn't that beautiful? And that's from the Old Testament. Don't let anybody tell you that the Old Testament, that's law. The New Testament is love and gospel. No. From the Garden of Eden <laughs> was the gospel promise. Amen? So, I dare not be misunderstood here. So let me make this perfectly clear. I'm talking about obedience that is the result, that is the natural outgrowth of our relationship with him with Jesus Christ. Because my Bible does tell me 
that heart obedience is the sign of a heart surrendered to God, of my love for God. Heart obedience. Not just outward obedience, right? Heart obedience. That's when I do the right thing when nobody else is looking. And we have a slide for that, a verse for that. 1 John 5, 3. Let's read this. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. How do you like that? His commandments are not burdensome. What does he say and what does Jesus tell us? He says, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Well, you, if you imagine a yoke of oxen or a yoke, of, you know, a, a team of mules, whatever the, the draft animals are, there's at least two of them, right? And so you've got, you're in the yoke with Jesus. Take my yoke. He says, my yoke. He's taking that yoke with you. He's walking with you in your Christian life. In uh, 1 John 2, 4, still 1 John, but chapter 2, we read this. Let's read this together. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Wow. God doesn't mince the words here. And Jesus didn't either when he was talking to people. If we say that we know him, but we don't keep his commandments, particularly when no one's looking, <laughs> we're not telling the truth. <laughs> we may be called a Christian, but we're not living the Christian life. And we're not experiencing the fullness of the blessing that God has for us. Because his commandments are not burdensome. On the contrary, they are the path of joy and the path of life. Read, go back and read some of the Psalms. He doesn't say, oh, Lord, you're, uh, I've got to meditate on your law again today. I've uh, got to spend some time meditating on your law. No, he rejoiced in God's law and God's commandments because it's an expression of God's will. So again, let me be perfectly clear. We do not earn our salvation by obedience. Salvation is a free gift from God to us that we receive by faith. But the Bible is also clear that obedience is a fruit of faith. 1 John, we're spending a lot of time in 1 John. This one says, let's read it. You know that Christ appeared in order to take away sins and that there is no sin in him. So everyone who lives in union with Christ does not continue to sin but whoever continues to sin has never seen him or known him. So, in my encounter with Christ, in your encounter with Christ, we begin to live in him, and so we are in union with Christ, and we do not continue to sin. In other words, it's not our habit anymore. Doesn't mean we don't stumble occasionally. And we have that text that we have an advocate with the Father, and we can confess and be forgiven. But habitually, we, we, we put that behind us. We talked about that when we talked about uh, uh, repentance, when, when sorry isn't enough. We can't just say, oh, I'm sorry. We have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I give this to you. Please help me with this particular area in my life. All right. Um, let's go to, to uh, James. Uh, that may be a familiar verse uh, for us that are, that, uh, are studying the adult uh, uh, Sabbath school lessons for this quarter. James 2.17. Let's read this out loud together. So it is with faith, if it is alone and includes no action, then it is dead. Again, very plain, very much to the point. Why? Because God doesn't want us to miss the point. In the, in, the, in the phraseology that we're f most familiar with, faith without works is dead, being alone. Yeah. We talked, we've talked about faith that works. Faith that works. Faith is, is the root, and the works are the fruit. By daily 
abiding in Christ and letting him be our vine dresser who cultivates and prunes and fertilizes and nurtures us, we can then say with Paul, who says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, let's read this one. I have been put to death with Christ on his cross so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. So who lives in us now? Jesus Christ. Who should people see when they look at us? Jesus Christ. Through our words, through our actions. Not because we're, we're the goody two-shoes, but because Jesus has changed us. And Jesus' love is shining out of us. And that's why salvation is not of works. Paul says lest anyone should boast, boast about good works that we do, because we realize that those good works spring from our relationship with Him, with Christ. And it's by His grace and His power that we can walk according to His will and to His law. Now, you may be listening to what I'm saying tonight and the, reading the verses together tonight and reflecting on your own spiritual experience. And you may wonder, do I have enough good fruit in my life that I can be assured that I am in Christ? Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're, I'm the, vine, you're the branches, if you abide in me. How much fruit do I need to know that I'm abiding in him? <laughs> well, you know and believe that God has forgiven your sins. You really want to be his child, but you know as you reflect in the quietness of your room and on your knees in prayer, you know that your character, I know that my character isn't perfect by any means. We see many faults in our lives. And because of this, we may wonder if the Holy Spirit has really made our hearts new. Well, I have good news for you. And I say, don't be discouraged. Don't let the devil tell you that God doesn't have you in the palm of your hands because you're not perfect yet. I have good news for you. Don't lose hope. Um, everybody received in their, in their packet here this uh, fine little book, Steps to Jesus, uh, published previously under the title Steps to Christ. But uh, in, the, in this little volume on page 63, this is the only time I'll actually quote from the book. But on page 63, I love this. Become like him. That's God's will for your life. That's his desire for your future. And you can count on him for that. I would like to thank God tonight publicly for the opportunity that he's given me in my life to be able to take up full-time gospel work. Ruth and I were always active in the church um, last couple of decades but, uh, and busy raising two wonderful sons and she, she deserves the credit for that and God of course. We're very proud of, of our two sons and, and our beautiful daughters-in-law and our now four grandchildren. But I praise God that he's permitted me to uh, spend full time again in gospel ministry. But in the intervening years, I was a pastor ordained in 1985 in the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. In the intervening years, we were active in the church. We, uh, we had Bible studies. We were elders in the church. Um, I guess uh, your, your mom's, one of your mom's friends are getting ordained at, uh, as a el local elder at PMC. Uh, Ruth, Ruth was ordained at PMC a number of years ago. But uh, Pioneer Memorial Church. But I'm thankful that no matter where we are, no matter what our walk of life, no matter what our vocation is, God can use us. Whether we're a Charles Finney or we're, whether we're a lumberman, he can use you. 
He can use me. He's waiting for that opportunity. All right, well, we're going to um, stand and open to hymn number seven, uh, 65, hymn number 65, that we use as our closing song each night. And uh, I invite you to stand as you open to 65, and then I'm going to have a closing prayer, and we'll sing the first stanza together. So prayer first, and then we'll sing. Thanks again for being here tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the great plan of salvation that you had already worked out within the Trinity before Adam and Eve were even created. Lord, you are not taken by surprise. And when we come to you with our needs, you are not surprised. No matter how dark the sin may be that anyone comes to you with, you are not shocked. For Jesus has suffered, suffered the anger and the curses and the worst that humanity can deal out. He was a man acquainted with grief and with sorrow. So, Lord, you can identify with us as we go through our daily lives. And where the rubber meets the road is that we are called upon to be Christians and to represent you, while at the same time we are enduring heartaches because of experiences in our lives and in the lives of those we love, whether they be emotional or physical or financial. And so, Father, it's not easy to keep a smile on our face when we're hurting inside. But we know, Lord, that you make our weakness perfection through your strength. Father, I pray that you'd watch over us as we go from this place. Bless us through the coming hours. Bless the services that will take place here tomorrow. And most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus, our precious Savior, who loves us so much that he came to this earth to live his life, die for us, and now reigns in heaven as our high priest and is eager to come and take us to, be, uh, take us to come home with him that we might ever be with the Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet, God be with you till we meet. Again. Good night. God bless you.